ask that you return to Revelation 22, beginning with the 12th verse. Amen. Amen. This is the word of God coming to the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos. Jesus is speaking directly to him. He says, Behold, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me. And I will give to everyone according to what he or she has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to be free of life, and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, sexual immoral, murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices also. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you his testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, and the bright morning star. Verse 17, powerful, verse 17. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. Whoever is thirsty, let him or her come. Whoever wishes, let him or her take the free gift of the water of life. May the Lord bless this reading to our hearts and understanding. Amen. Amen. But we're dealing with Revelation 22, the verses just read to you, and it says, Come, Lord Jesus. And Jesus is telling John that he's coming soon. And if you remember in that wonderful Gospel of St. John, the 14th chapter, verses 2 and 3, Jesus lets them know that he has to leave his disciples and that's why he's going to uh, give up his life. He says, I go to prepare a place for you and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Unquote. Jesus is coming soon. The Apostle Paul writes of this soon return of Christ, coming will be by surprise. He states in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2, For you yourselves know well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Unquote. Like a thief in the night. For some it's going to be a nice surprise. For others it's going to be a nightmare. Question in the New Testament second coming expectations is how soon is soon? How soon is soon? Jesus gives the answer. He says, No one knows the answer but God the Father in heaven. No one knows but the Father. Pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer, while he was a prisoner waiting to be executed by the Germans during the Second World War, he wrote, We live each day as if it were our last, and each day as if there were to be a great future. Unquote. This writing is taken from his letters and papers on page 15. The second coming will be the end of history, we know that. But we also know that our lives will come to an end in 
for most of us probably before the second coming, before the end of history. And we don't know when that is either. And I believe that on that day, whenever it happens, whenever it comes into my experience, that that'll be the second coming of Christ. I truly believe in, in what I've read that there'll be somebody coming for us. Might be your loved one, someone you knew well. Maybe Jesus, maybe, maybe someone you pray to in the scriptures. The Bible says, be ye prepared. Be prepared. Here's where our text is so important. As long as we live and breathe, We are to embrace what verse 17 is saying to us. <clears throat> and the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. The Spirit of God and the Bride of Christ, which is the Church. <clears throat> Spirit and the Church say, Come. Let him who thirsts, or her who thirsts, come. And whoever desires, let them drink of the water so that they will not thirst again. It's an open invitation. I believe it's an open invitation to the world. To the ministry and the mission of the bride, which is the church, along with the Holy Spirit, is calling out the words of generous encouragement to all who are thirsty, to all who yearn to have the Lord in their life. Feel the power of God Almighty to uplift their spirits and to be their peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus is offered to all who thirst, and that becomes our ministry and mission. What then should we do next? N.T. Wright, uh, who is a very famous uh, theologian, biblical scholar, written many, many books and papers, sometimes gets a little deep, but he's a great writer, a great thinker. He wrote a, his latest book is God and the Pandemic. Can't get uh, much closer to the reality we're living in. God in the pandemic. And he writes in that book that we should embrace the work of the psalmist by lamenting the situation in which we find ourselves. As the vital initial Christian response to this pandemic is to lament. Almost one-third of the entire book of Psalms is lamenting Psalms. Almost one-third. The Psalms show the psalmist lamenting to God because things are not the way they should be. No, not the way they should be. It is a passionate expression of grief or sorrow spoken to God. Lamenting really means to mourn. To mourn means to verbalize what you're feeling, what is disquieting to your soul. And we definitely find ourselves in mourning with the entire world. C.S. Lewis wrote, Many years ago, uh, when his uh, wife, whose name was Joy, died, and he was deeply, deeply in love with her. And he said, the deaths of Joy, the grief that I am experiencing, is like the world over everything, the sky over everything. It's that painfulness of grief. 
And N.T. Wright says we should be willing as Christians to mourn with the entire world. So our calling, first and foremost, I believe, is to humbly take our place beside the mourners. And certainly we could do it here. There's no one who's not under that bereavement experience, I don't think. You know somebody who's died from this virus, or you've heard of somebody who you used to work for or with, someone you knew, someone you went to high school with, someone you loved. You, you know people who have died, and then you're, you're in a state of bereavement, you're mourning. Lamenting is to face the pain of that situation. We must pray and speak to God about our feelings. He asks us to do that. We should look to God for his intervention with patience and great confidence. Being trustworthy that there's a plan here. We don't know what it is yet, but it's coming. A blessing from God. But we should not expect easy or quick solutions either. So our souls are emotionally upset. We are frightened by what is occurring, and that's normal. I want to uh, read to you from Psalm 43. New King James Version, Vindicate me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. O oh, deliver me from the deceitful and unjust person. For you are the God of my strength. Why do you cast me off? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression? the enemy. Oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your tabernacle. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and on the harp I will praise you. Oh God, my God. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Open oh God, for I shall yet praise him. The help of my countenance and my God. A reading from Psalm 43. One of the lamenting psalms. great verse from Job, who had such terrible things happening to him. In desperation, he says, though you slay me, my God, I will trust you and serve you. We don't really know or understand why certain things are happening, but there's an awful lot of things happening. And that is why we are needed to lament so that we can try to understand what does it really mean for me to go through this? Why am I going through this? Why are you going through this? What, what is the church supposed to experience from this? It's not just to pray to God, oh, to take this away and, and bless us with healing. Yes, we want that. It's not to hide ourselves and uh, stick our heads in the sand or, or be in denial that this, these things are happening. Well, don't turn the TV on, don't look at the news. You know, we retreat from that. But really what we need to do as, as we are lamenting what's going on is that we need to try to discern what it is that's happening. And what is it actually saying to me, the way I'm living? And I don't believe that, that, that God has somehow put this on, uh, against us for punishment, but that it, it's a, he's allowing it to happen so that we can learn something. 
And it's time that the uh, Christians who, so-called Christians, and I might be speaking to the choir, I hope so, but that so-called Christians would begin to see the light, begin to live as Christians, begin to be loving, forgiving, and caring to mourn with those who mourn, and to laugh with those who laugh, and rejoice with those who rejoice. We have to discern why God is allowing this to happen. Yet, what are we to learn? For me, I believe that this is the result of a serious moral dilemma which demands a spiritual, political, and a social response. The response is clear and can be understood by reading the prophet Micah's entire message, his whole letter. The bottom line of the message can be found in Micah 6. Verses 6 through 8. Verse 6 reads, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? With calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Here is the very climax of what he's saying. Verse 8, he has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your Lord? Thus, the reading of my God. I believe that we are to share in the groaning of the Spirit, and that is where we are conformed then to the image of Jesus Christ. We don't have an answer for what's going on until we get to be one with Jesus Christ, until we are able to accept His will for us, His purpose for our lives, So we are converted to live according to God's will for our lives. I want to be the me that you want me to be, God. It's time for each and every one of us to think about that. <clears throat> the Spirit, God, and the Bride said, Come. I wanted to read something to you. It's uh, taken from a book, The Unshakable Truth, written in 2010 by Josh McDowell and Sean McDowell. How you can experience the 12 essentials of a relevant faith. Way back in the back of the book, he has a little passage that I want to read to you. Let's try to relax and, and hear what he's saying. He says, I'm going to read something as though God is personally sharing his heart with you right now. 
And he says this, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I am the one who is always, who always was, and who is still to come, the Almighty One. I am the infinite God who knows no boundaries or limitations. My power and knowledge and greatness are beyond your comprehension. My love and holiness and beauty are so intense that for you to see me in all my glory would overwhelm you. For as a, moral, a mortal, you could not see me and live. And yet, I created you to know me intimately. For I am passionate about my relationship with you. But a relationship isn't complete unless the love cycle, each one of us knowing and being known, is completed. I want you to know that I know you. And I want you to know me. I know everything there is about you. I know your favorite color, your favorite food, what music you like, the dreams you have, and the future you long for. I know your struggles and weaknesses, and I am glad with you when you make right choices. I am saddened when you make wrong choices. I know you better than you know yourself, and I love you. But I want to ask you a question, not for my information, but for yours. Do you love me? I mean, really love me? Be slow to answer. Be sure before you speak. And before you do, let me tell you the secret to really loving me. To love me, you must come to know me. For to know me is to love me. Learn of my mercy and my faithfulness, and you will love me. Come to know my goodness and holiness, and you will love me. Learn of my justice, tempered with patience, and you will love me. Know what I love and what I hate, and you will love me. Know what saddens my heart and what gives me pleasure, and you will love me. This is the way to have eternal life, to know me, the only true God. And the more you know me, the more you will become like me. The more you know me, the more you will praise and thank me and honor my name. And the more you know me, the more you will love others as I love them. There are two ways to know me. First is through my Holy Spirit. I have sent you my Spirit to live within you. Allow me to fill you with my Spirit. Make me a home in your heart. Speak to me often in your prayers. Confide your fears, your hopes, your dreams to me. Let me live my life through you. I am with you always and I will never leave you. The second way to know me is through the written revelation of me, my holy word, the collection of my love letters to you. Read my words, hide them in your heart and know, know me for who I am, the one true God, your Savior, and your friend. I long for you to communicate with me by opening your heart in prayer. And as you hear the words of the following prayer, I urge you to make the prayer your own. Let the words come from your heart, very silently, to me. And here's the prayer. Anyone who would like it, uh, a copy of it next week, I would have copies. Let us pray. For oh God, you are great, but I know so little of your greatness. I know you are merciful and faithful and holy and just, but I really know so little of you. 
I want to thank you for your Holy Spirit. I welcome you to be more and more at home in my heart. I thank you for your Holy Word and for giving me, right now, this very moment, a longing to know you and a hunger to read your love letters to me. I ask you to help me. Help me by giving me a desire to read your word more often. As I read, help me to see you and know you in every page, so I can be like you, O oh God. Let me honor you with my life. I sense your smiling at me right now. Thank you. Thank you for loving me. I love you too. Amen. Amen.